Mm, I'm just going to take it off. Okay. <laughs> Sonicum, everyone. Um, alhamdulillah, I took notes kind of as we went along, and I just wanted to add like a few really um, key points. Um, so the first one was actually, I'm just going to comment on a video that I watched in class this week, and it was a little boy who was talking to his mom, and he was telling his mom, you know, mom, I was feeling angry today, and my emotions, and he was having this whole beautiful little, like, baby talk conversation with his mother about anger, and if you're on TikTok, you may have seen this video. Um, so he tells her, mom, I was feeling, you know, and he's specifically talking about how he was feeling angry. So he tells her, mom, I was feeling angry today, and she's like, that's okay, and at the tail end of the video, he tells me, and mom, did you love me when I was angry? And she says, yes, of course, and she hugs him. And I, I think I can't normalize enough how much validation your, your young, young ones are going to seek from you right now. And I've got some points about your, you know, teenagers and your young adults, but your young ones are really going to look for, is it okay for me to feel the way that I'm feeling right now? And it, Dr. Sister Wajma kind of touched on this, right? Like, don't tell them you can't be sad and don't tell them you can't be angry. That this is not quite the time to kind of talk them through the different emotions. And you want to make sure that your children is fostering a your children are fostering a safe space to come and share with you how they're feeling when things are getting really difficult, when things are getting really heavy. Um, if your kid is only ever sharing with you, "Mom, I'm great," and "Mom, I'm happy," maybe ask yourself, "Does my kid know how to feel sad?" Um, I cannot express to you how many of my clients don't know how to be sad, don't know how to feel. They tell me, "Muna, I'm happy," but you can't see it. I'm like, "Well, you know." When I'm angry and I'm like, well, I don't see anger, right? I see like numb. I see someone who can't express emotion. And then when I talk to them, they tell me I was never allowed to express at home. If I had a reaction, my parents would tell me not now. And I, I'm telling you, I have clients in their 60s who can't express some of these emotions. So this is a lifelong um, like journey for some. And Sister Wajma touched on this as well, and I'll build on it a little bit. Social learning theory, your kids are looking at you to role model emotional regulation and expression right now. They are looking at you and they will take from you because you are, if you're a primary caregiver or an elder in the household, they're watching you and they're watching how you respond across the board. And if you suppress your emotions, Dr. Rania talked about people saying right now, well, it's not as bad as it is for people over there right now for me here, if that's the approach you're taking, know that your kids will never feel like their issues are worth talking about. And then you're going to bring them to Maristan, inshallah, and we're going to work with them for months. This is not a, I've had parents tell me, can you fix my kid? They're 14. Okay, where have you been for 14 years? I told my kid that I didn't have time or I spent my work away from my children and there wasn't really that connection built. Therapy is great. It takes time. It's not going to be a fix overnight. And so I really, really, really want to drive that message home to a lot of parents who have younger kids right now. Sit with your kids and process your emotions. Mommy, are you feeling sad? Yes, baby, I'm feeling sad. This is hard. This feels heavy. Mommy, where does it feel heavy? It feels heavy in my chest. It feels heavy in my shoulders. Mommy, I'm not sleeping well. I had a mother tell me today, her kid who has not really, who has been relatively okay in the dark, Mommy, will you walk me into my room? I'm scared someone's going to kidnap me. And he's hugging her feet. He's hugging her leg. He's just, I think he's about four. Mommy, I'm scared someone's going to take me away in the dark. And these are, these are real. And alhamdulillah, if your kid is able to verbalize those. Because some kids, they experience something or they are witness to something and the words come later. So Dr. Rania mentioned kind of keeping tabs on your child's behavior. And, and I want to be clear that this is not just for five days or when this is over. Some of this stuff we see when in a year, in two, sometimes three, they're finding the words and now they're going to process that as, a, as young adults in whatever age group it comes to them. They're going to start processing that in that time. And so you're, the, the one thing I took back from, inshallah, many other things, but the one thing that has always stuck out to me about working with adolescents is parents miss mental health issues in, chill, in adolescents because they say they're a teenager, they're going to act out. They're a teenager, this is expected, and we just let it go. And then we see it's so detrimental, and events like what we're seeing right now exacerbate already existing mental health issues that our teenagers are facing, that your young kids are facing, and honestly, that adults are facing too. It, it is hard. It is hard and it is heavy to continuously see this and process it. But give yourself time to sit and process.
there's days where you're like, the best I can do right now is make a meal. Say alhamdulillah and congratulate yourself for making that meal because your family needed you and you needed that meal. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided you, gave you the energy to get up and make that meal. And if that's all you got done, alhamdulillah. Dr. Zahra and I were at Stanford last week and we did a healing circle and there was a sister there from Gaza and she was really just feeling so helpless. Like, I am here. It is my first year here. She's a first year PhD student at Stanford. And she's like, of all of the times that I was here, now what is happening to my people? And I looked at her and I said, what do you do? And she said, I write. And I told her, write your story. That's what you have. That's why Allah put you here. That's a, a skill that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. Write the story. Right? Everybody is going to face different trials and turbulations across our lifetime. It's not, it's not just today and it's not just tomorrow. So think of what has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gifted you with? What are the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has? You know, there's so many. What are they? And have, channel them into your families and channel them into your education. It's been really hard for me to be a PhD student right now because I've got so much work and I have maybe the brain, the bandwidth and the attention span of a very, very small animal right now. But I'm like, okay, Mona, this is what Allah gave you. You can, you can show up and you can get through your work and you can get through your assignments because this is where I need to be right now. And I trust that Allah put me here because I am able and I have the ability to turn around and support my community. Um, one of the, you know, one of the other things I really wanted to touch on was um, the brain's response to trauma. I'll talk about it a little bit from a neurological perspective so that, um, so that we, we kind of like learn what's happening. I've had, Dr. Zahra touched on, you know, maybe don't write an email when you're angry. You know, you, you might write something and feel so in that moment, uh, this is truth, this is exactly what I mean to say, and you press send, right? Um, I can tell you on, on our end, uh, at my university, I've had to send emails all week. And one of them took me a week to send because I would sit there and I read it and I read it again and I made sure it was respectful and professional but also in, in honor of my community and in honor of the people who have lost their lives. That's what they're, you know, they're losing their lives. I can at least stick up for their lives here. I can at least call out the injustice in a way that, that keeps me, inshallah, steadfast in my education but also honors the community. And that was really important. How many people heard of fight or flight? Fight or flight, great news, alhamdulillah. Okay, so when we go into fight or flight, what happens with our brain, right? Our executive functioning right up here at the front, our executive functioning is responsible for decision making. This is where emotional regulation comes in. When you toggle into fight or flight, something has happened. And I want you to keep in context, not just you, but also your children. Something has happened and your prefrontal cortex actually switches off. Your amygdala, your fight or flight respo response system toggles on. They cannot be on at the same time, one or the other. If you are in fight or flight, your executive functioning is off, which means you are not, you, not to say you're not like thinking clearly, but there is something that is more pressing for the brain right now, and I need to address this immediate item. Your brain doesn't differentiate fear of a tiger, okay, the, the trauma of a tiger standing in front of you or a bear chasing you from a car accident. It's considered trauma. It's cons that is how it's understood in your brain. So when you're in that fight or flight, if you think of like your kids, if they're seeing images right now and they're starting to get activated and they're in fight or flight, I, I sincerely ask, we don't tell them to calm down. Nobody ever calm down because somebody told them to calm down. Think about what's happening for them. You might talk at them. This is, you're overreacting. They're not hearing you. They're reacting. They're not hearing the words. So what can we do? One of the things that, um, so I, I do, like my emphasis at school is in trauma and one of the things I'm, I work through is kind of like treatment through like, you know, a trauma-informed lens. And one of the things that you can do is a grounding exercise. It can be as simple as let's count to 10 together. One, two, three, and so on. How many, if you, I have a lot of plants in my office, how many plants are in the room? You activate the other side of the brain. You now are engaging the, that logical side. Count, you know, count the rooms, count, count the plants, count the books, anything. And then that, you'll see that, that switch, and then you're like, okay. And they're like, okay, yeah, like, I'm good, <laughs> you know. Um, 
So I really want you to think of that. If you're seeing higher rates of anxiety around, around kind of like your children or just like feelings of irritability, like it's, it's not coming from nowhere. And everybody talked about validating that, that experience and that emotion. So inshallah, I won't touch on that. Um, but just really think about it. And if, you, if you're not sure, this is why this is happening right now. Consult with the people in your community who know. Consult with the people in your community who can guide you to the resources that your children need. Right? Saying, I don't know is so important, but find people who know and guide your children or guide yourself to that resource. You know, like, I, I really urge you, don't sit on it and say, inshallah, it'll get better tomorrow. You know, it's, inshallah, it t today, right now, I'm kind of going out to do this. Um, and so, inshallah, I'll end there. I'm happy to kind of answer any questions later, but I know that we wanted to also open the space um, for everybody. So, um, inshallah. Jazakallah, everyone.